of the uh, of the Digital Grid webinar series, and we'll introduce um, uh, our our great panel uh, for today. But once again, this is the sixth of our Digital Grid Summer Webinar series uh, that follows the Digital Grid Virtual Workshop that we held in in June. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we have every one of you as attendees on mute. Uh, there are two ways that you can uh, ask questions. Uh, the one we recommend is to uh, go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a uh, cloud icon for chat. That's our chat feature. And uh, that's a great way to uh, provide questions, to interact with the, uh, with the speakers and moderators and to uh, provide questions uh, in that way. Uh, there's also an option if you look at the, um, uh, you know, to, to ask a question in the Q&A, uh, and uh, either way is fine, and we will, as moderators, ask those questions uh, to, uh, to our speakers as we go through. Uh, we are recording this presentation, and your participation is your consent to be uh, part of this recording, and the recordings and the presentations will be available at both the Stanford and EPRI um, uh, websites, and uh, Leanne will talk a bit about that. Again, uh, we're delighted as EPRI to be co-hosts with Stanford. Uh, we both uh, are uh, approaching this from very similar and complementary uh, perspectives. Uh, EPRI is an independent not-for-profit research organization focused on every aspect of utility operations, uh, and our focus is on uh, ad advancing the safety, reliability, affordability, and uh, uh, environmental responsibility associated with, with the grid through collaborative research. Uh, in much the same way, uh, Stanford's Bits and Watts initiative uh, is really focused on advancing the grid to, for, the, for the next century through business innovation, uh, policies, uh, and technologies on both the customer and, and grid edge to uh, enhance the customer utility relationship. So we're, we're really uh, uh, very happy to have had the uh, success of this uh, series uh, through the summer. So our objectives, uh, it's really to convene experts from uh, diverse backgrounds and uh, varied disciplines to exchange views on what a shared integrated digital grid represents. And you'll see to the right, there are a number of elements that uh, are or can be uh, elements of this grid. Uh, and where, where we look at, our real focus is to look at some of the key gaps to attaining this vision. And uh, one of the primary um, kind of touchstones for what a uh, shared integrated digital grid would represent would be the ability to integrate customer resources uh, seamlessly as uh, agents to help with grid flexibility. And one of the key gaps is uh, enabling data platforms and other related systems uh, to, uh, you know, get us to that end state. So the experts that we've had from multiple backgrounds and with multiple themes each week are really to, uh, helping us to understand uh, from the utility point of view what the requirements are, what the realities are on the ground, what are some of the things that have been learned from pilots and demonstrations and even rollouts uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the real world. And then from the academic and research point of view uh, and from the technology provider point of view to understand what some of the uh, technological and, and other gaps are to achieving some of these enabling technologies towards this end. Ultimately, what we are endeavoring to do, and uh, this is for both uh, sort of EPRI and, uh, and Stanford, is to inform a research roadmap and to develop a collaborative research initiative informed by the perspectives that have been uh, shared by the cumulative uh, effect of these, uh, of our digital workshop and, and seminars. And uh, again, uh, there are many ways to encapsulate what a, uh, a shared integrated digital grid represents, but as I said, the, one of the key uh, themes that we are, are using throughout our discussion is the integration of customer resources uh, as options to, to help optimize grid flexibility. So, so that's a, uh, through today's theme of customer resiliency uh, and resiliency with customer DERs, that's a, a very key aspect and we're looking forward to this discussion. With that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague Leanne Ming from Stanford to, to tell us a bit more about uh, uh, what we've done so far and what we're going to do today. So Leanne, over to you. 
Thank you, Omar. And uh, uh, again, you know, we are very happy and glad and honored to co-host this webinar series with APRI. And uh, just a little bit of recap uh, what had been discussed and uh, what kind of uh, webinars we have been hosting in the last uh, uh, month or two. And uh, in June, we have the uh, Digital Grid Virtual Workshop. We uh, brought together several U.S. utility, European utility together, plus uh, IT companies like uh, Google, Microsoft, Intel, and VMware uh, to discuss the current practice at the utility, at the IT company, you know, what kind of data platform they have been using or they are thinking to bring the customer into the grid. Then starting from last month uh, in July, and we had uh, uh, four webinars uh, with the support from different uh, uh, group of uh, players uh, in this field, including the startup company, universities, and uh, uh, federal and state um, uh, funding uh, agencies, and also uh, uh, some of the uh, previous uh, conversation we had. And starting from this month, and uh, what we're going to have is uh, uh, four webinars, and uh, each of them will focus on one perspective of the value that the customer DER can bring to the grid. So if you're interested in the previous seven uh, webinars, you can find the recording from both Apple website and also uh, Stanford Business uh, event website. So this is uh, uh, the four uh, panels we uh, are planning or we are lined up uh, in this month. And uh, uh, actually, we planned today's webinar uh, about uh, several weeks ago, and uh, we cannot predict the future. So we didn't predict that uh, they're going to have a hurricane happening uh, in this week. And uh, all of us are living a presidential uh, time with COVID-19, with lockdown, people stay at home, and the utility still has the responsibility to keep life on. And uh, they did a great job. And, uh, but uh, I look at the, uh, the outage report this morning, we still have about 2.5 million customers uh, in the Northeast area without power. And uh, so it's, it's very important for us to discuss that, how the customer DER can bring the value to help enhance the grid resilience. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the three outstanding panelists for today's conversation. And uh, uh, what we are going to do is we will start with one utility from certain company. And uh, we have uh, uh, Phil Markham, and uh, he is the manager and the lead for uh, smart building research and the development of certain company. He will share with us uh, what the definition of resilience from utility perspective, from a utility perspective. Then also we'll discuss two flagship projects uh, about smart neighborhood. Uh, running by certain company R&D group. Then we will move to uh, the industry consortium, APRI, uh, will discuss with us a group of utility perspective, the definition of resilience, the value of resilience. We have uh, uh, Sarah Bolin Trento, and uh, she is the uh, uh, strategic issue lead and also the TI Technology Innovation Liaison uh, for APRI's initiative called the Resilience Research Institute uh, Interest Group. Then we'll move to more broader, the federal perspective, more than just utility, and we also need to coordinate with different agencies. We have uh, Stephen Walsh from Department of Energy Office of Electricity, and uh, he has been uh, leading several efforts uh, in the past, including the recovery effort for the hurricanes Irma and Maria three years ago. And also he uh, was the, the lead author for the uh, federal's Island play, uh, uh, Playbook and uh, uh, lead the Energy Transition Initiative several years ago. So we will start with Phil, to Sarah, to Stephen, to share their perspective about resilience, the value of resilience, the definite resilience, and also several use cases and how the customer DER can bring the value to enhance the system resilience. Okay, with that, I will have Phil to kick off the conversation. Hey, thank you, Liang. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone, to uh, uh, everyone in the U.S., uh, and good afternoon, good evening to uh, international listeners. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, EPRI and uh, the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative 
uh, for hosting the Digital Grid Summer Series. I've uh, I really listen, enjoyed listening uh, to some of the previous sessions. Um, and, you know, it's, Southern Company realizes that uh, we need extensive collaboration uh, to realize uh, the, the, this integrated grid, um, the shared integrated grid that we're, we're talking about. So this is great. We, we realize that we're going to need uh, co collaboration between uh, industry, technology companies, and uh, academic thought leaders as well. So uh, I've really enjoyed listening to some of the previous sessions, and uh, based on what I just saw, I, I'll be listening to some of the, the coming webinars as well. Um, before I get into the, the main part of my presentation today, wanted to give a quick overview of Southern Company uh, through our three electric and four gas utilities. Uh, we serve approximately 9 million customers across six states, Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Virginia. And in, in addition to our retail state uh, regulated utility businesses, uh, we also have an independent power producer called Southern Power. Um, we operate in many more states. Um, so we operate in, in the competitive wholesale markets there. Uh, we have gas generation assets as part of that, uh, that uh, independent power producer. We also have 1.7 gigawatts of solar and 1.6 uh, rather gigawatts of wind. Uh, Southern also owns PowerSecure. Um, PowerSecure is the largest microgrid developer in the US, uh, having deployed about 1,700 microgrids. Uh, and that equates to about 85% of US market share. Uh, we, we are planning for a low carbon future. Uh, our long-term greenhouse gas emissions reduction goal is to have net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and our intermediate goal is for a 50% reduction by 2030 from 2000 levels. Uh, but we think we might get there uh, earlier. We think we might get there by 2025, uh, driven primarily by low uh, natural gas prices. Um, in 2019, we'd already decreased emissions from 2007 levels by 44%. Um, and I just wanted to introduce me, me really quick. I'm coming to you from Southern Company's Research and Development Group. Uh, I lead Southern's research activities around customer energy resources, uh, specifically around uh, energy efficiency, electrification, uh, and integrating these resources with the electric power system. I also wanted to say a quick word on why I chose, I personally chose a career in electric power, um, specifically national and regional electric power grids, because uh, I think it's somewhat relevant to our topic today. Um, when I was studying, uh, doing my undergraduate electrical engineering degree in Australia, um, where I'm originally from, uh, it, was, it, was, it was only then that I first became aware of the complexity and, and the coordination uh, involved in the electric power system, everything that it takes to have your light come on when you flick that light switch. And, and I remember, uh, I think I was in my uh, second or third year of that degree, just being really amazed um, uh, at what was involved. Um, and oh boy, what a time to be joining the industry uh, because that level of coordination, I think we all realize, uh, and, and that level of complexity is about to increase. Uh, a lot as we as we seek to extend the grid behind uh, or beyond the meter uh, and integrate millions of customer devices. So, you know, that's definitely something that that captivates me still, uh, and I am, um, you know, I am motivated to be part of of integrating uh, these these devices, uh, keeping our reliability levels high, um, lo keeping costs low. Uh, I, I also think it's going to be a great enabler for decarbonization um, and, and an enabler of greater resiliency. So I'm, uh, I, I, think, I think my motivation for being in the industry actually relates to what we're talking about today. Uh, on to the next slide. Um, yeah, how, how does Southern think about resiliency? Um, so I, I'll, I'll give an, an academic uh, definition uh, and then, and then I'll talk about kind of where where Southern's at. So, in theory, uh, we think about this is a good definition. I think I think it lines up with how Southern Company thinks about it. Uh, robustness and recovery characteristics of utility infrastructure and operations, which avoid or minimise interruptions of service during an extraordinary or hazardous event. So, um, as most people 
on listening in will know resiliency is different to reliability. Reliability in electric power system is the ability for the electric power system to respond to fairly, um, you know, uh, normal events um, that happen in the course of the year, like a generation trip or a transmission line trip um, due to a lightning strike or something like that. Um, you know, we, did, we have our metrics in the industry for reliability. Resiliency is thinking about uh, unusual events, uh, even potentially events uh, that, haven't, that, that haven't actually happened historically. Uh, and it's something we take really seriously. Uh, our, our CEO, uh, Tom Fanning, uh, is actually co-chair of the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, uh, which is an industry government partnership charged with coordinating efforts to prepare for uh, and respond to cyber and physical threats uh, against the electric grid. So at the highest level, we are uh, Southern companies thinking about this. Um, now in practice, uh, how do we, how does it, how does resilience um, fit into our planning practices? What kind of metrics do we use? How do we value it? Um, I, I think it, like a lot of other utilities, uh, we're still grappling with that. So um, we do, uh, we do currently strengthen uh, parts of the system that are, you know, historically exposed to um, severe weather. Um, you know, we'll either strengthen the poles uh, on the power delivery system or we'll do undergrounding. But, um, you know, we don't yet have, I would say, a robust framework for the metrics. Um, so the, both the preparation and then the response to uh, or the or the valuation. So I think Southern. I mean, we can continue that conversation, but Southern is is uh, part of some industry groups. Uh, EPRI is leading one of them that we're part of, uh, where we're we're thinking about this and trying to put a framework together. And so. Going to the world that I live in day to day and uh, the technology and research and development projects, two I wanted to talk about today that involve uh, using customer uh, DR assets um, is our two smart neighborhood projects. So we have one uh, in Alabama uh, and one in Georgia. The one in Alabama uh, is a few years old now, so we, that, that research project has been running for a while. Uh, the Smart Neighborhood Project in Atlanta, uh, which is 46 townhomes, is still being built. Um, but the 62 single-family home development in Birmingham, Alabama, um, is, is a more mature research project. Uh, our major research partners with these two projects um, are Oak Ridge National Lab, the DOE Lab, uh, and the Electric Power Research Institute. First, just to talk about the Alabama Power Smart Neighborhood, uh, this project, uh, and I, I could talk about it for a long time, it has a lot of different aspects, um, but just to give a, a real quick overview, the, the project was originally called Neighborhood of the Future because we wanted to, we wanted to think about, okay, what, what would a neighborhood in, say, 2030, 2035 look like and how are we going to serve it? Um, so these homes are extremely energy efficient. They have a home energy rating score. Uh, in the low 40s for people who are familiar with that system to very, very tight, efficient homes, um, very efficient uh, heat pump electric, uh, electric heat pump water heating and uh, heat pump space heating and cooling. Uh, and in terms of the, the DR assets and resiliency, this neighborhood has a microgrid uh, located about a mile from the 62 home development uh, that's comprised of solar lithium ion battery uh, and a natural gas generator, and the the neighborhood can be islanded with the market grid, and that has uh, that has happened. We've done it on purpose, and then real events have happened, and it and uh, and it has and it has worked. So we have successfully uh, islanded that community, powering it just off the market grid, separating it from the rest of Alabama power system multiple times. Uh, I'll also share that we, we've had issues with it as well. Uh, it hasn't always worked. Um, and, you know, I remember talking to one of our uh, power electronics uh, uh, experts about that. Uh, and one of the things he, he pointed out to me, because, uh, you know, I was wondering, 
the microgrids have been around for a long time. Why, why are we having um, issues here? And one of the things he pointed out to me was microgrids have been around a long time as islanded power systems. When you have them normally connected to the grid uh, and then need them to be able to switch out an island, that just adds a lot of complexity. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's a research project, so we expected not you know, everything not to go perfect. But um, yeah, just want to say that that it has worked most of the time. I think it is a success, but there were some there was a learning curve there. Um, and, and one of the things that's that's really interesting as a researcher, you know, you work really hard on on having everything come together. Back to the the earlier comment about the light switch, um, uh, turning the light on when uh, when, when you flick it. Um, you know, when everything worked perfectly, uh, the microgrid uh, powered the, the neighborhood, the, the customers in the neighborhood didn't even know. <laughs> you know, and I remember joking with someone on the team, gosh, I, I wish we could, how, how can we get a pat on the back for this, you know, uh, to show that uh, everything worked and hey, everyone else uh, lost power, but because you're part of this research project, uh, we were able to keep you online. Um, and that, you know, that, that goes back to, just thinking about electricity, it's just something that you really, most people don't notice unless it's, unless it's not there. Um, and so, yeah, we can talk more about that, that project uh, later. I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, the, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, jumping over to the Georgia Power Smart neighborhood in Atlanta, uh, these are townhomes uh, built uh, uh, five, six, seven, uh, or eight kind of together. Uh, so they are sharing uh, one wall. Uh, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes two walls, of course, if they're in the middle. Uh, these homes, in terms of DR assets, have uh, batteries in the garage. Um, and so we have not the whole home, but uh, we have some loads uh, on a critical load panel. And we're powering, uh, in, in the instance of a grid outage, uh, we're powering certain loads in that home. Um, in both neighborhoods, we're controlling the water heaters and the HVAC systems in response to different grid signals. Um, so we're experimenting with how can we provide grid services from these devices uh, without uh, causing the customer any discomfort or interruption. And, I, and I'll, I'll just say before I move to the next slide, uh, one of the and I think we'll, we'll talk more about this. Um, one of the one of the dilemmas you're faced with when you have a, um, I guess either a microgrid or a behind the meter asset like storage, um, is how much energy do you keep in reserve for a a reliability or a resiliency event, uh, and how much do you use it for for grid services? Um, so if theoretically um, so, so I can tell you, my my wife in uh, living in Alabama uh, in July or August, uh, in the middle of the day, she's going to put a very high value on having energy in the battery um, if it, if it's able to uh, power the HVAC and keep the house cool uh, with four small children. Um, and so, in that instance. Um, there's, there's going to be a trade-off there between resiliency and using these, these DR assets for uh, grid flexibility and integrating renewables. Um, I think there's a conversation we could have there about, about that balance and how we think that's going to play out. Um, customer DR's resiliency value. Um, so really uh, what I wanted to say here is, um, you know, resiliency like a lot of other attributes that we're thinking about when we think about distributed energy resources um, is, uh, you know, it's something that, um, that there's a lot of debate over uh, in terms of its valuation. So, you know, putting resiliency to the side for a second, what are some of the other uh, attributes that we, we hear in the industry being spoken about? Uh, we hear, um, you know, peak demand, shaving, um, Distribution system deferral, uh, spinning reserve, uh, provision of spinning reserve. If you have a um, a generation trip event, um, 
you know, there are all these different uh, values uh, that we're seeking to stack. Um, resiliency, in my mind, would be another one. Um, sometimes you, sometimes these these things, uh, you know, account uh, are um, you can't align. Uh, I gave that example of you know maybe resiliency and and providing some of these other services um, are orthogonal in terms of being able to optimize them. Um, so that's something we should we should think about. Um, I, I heard one of the panelists in a in a previous presentation uh, talk about how, uh, in terms of load flexibility, TOU rates um, as we see a lot of different uh, regions around uh, the U.S. and the world um, really roll those out on mass. I think are actually going to be a really good way of seeing. Um, a customer's response to price. Um, I think we'll, we'll get a lot of information there about, um, you know, how how customers respond to that, how much flexibility there really is there. Um, you know, my my thoughts are probably with resiliency, especially if you if we get to a technology point where we can actually leverage behind the meter assets. And power other things on the distribution feeder. Um, so once we we change inverter standards and we have the right switching intelligence, you know, I could say power my neighbor's house if he doesn't have solar, but I do. Um, you know, that uh, that is going to be um, something that I think is is really exciting. Um, but uh, I think that a lot of these a lot of these values we probably need to prove operationally. Uh, before we defer uh, capital uh, decisions or, or, or reliability decisions. So I think we probably need, I think TOU rates will give us a lot of information about load flexibility, um, how much we can rely on that load. Will it be there when we really, really need it, especially in extreme ambient temperatures? Uh, I think we just need a lot of field data to kind of get comfortable with what resource will be there. Uh, I think. I think valuing it in terms of its operational value will be helpful, and then we can probably get to a point where we can actually integrate it into the planning process. Um, but happy, happy to take questions on that and, and debate that, uh, debate that more. Um, I, I'll, I'll just finish with I think however you do value uh, resiliency, um, probably it has to go beyond just the, the unserved load calculation. So what was it? Kind of worth within the utility um, business model. Um, you know, a kilowatt hour is really there to support comfort, health, and quality of life. Uh, and so, I, I think we do need to capture uh, the full value of that. And with that, I'm I'm going to end. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh Phil, thank you very much. That was a that was a fabulous uh, uh, presentation. A lot there. Uh, appreciate that. We're going to transition over to uh, Sarah Mullen Trento from EPRI uh, to talk about our value of resilience interest group. So, Sarah, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Really excited to be here today and get the chance to talk with all of you about the interest group we've been, <clears throat> excuse me, running for the past few months and excited to um, to follow Phil and, and proceed DOE in hearing more about this really important topic. Um, in, in hearing from Phil already, we heard a little bit about what resilience means and when we look at reliability and resilience, just to provide some context for this discussion, um, in general, when we talk about resilience, we're talking about longer duration outages, high impact, low frequency events, something that has a bigger geographic impact. Um, and while these may be similar events or similar build back restoration just on a bigger scale, the cost is is different. So we're really at a point where we understand that when you get longer duration outages where you move beyond simple conveniences and really get into a comfort and um, and and health and safety space, the economic and social impact 
just doesn't scale from from what it looks like with an outage of um, just a few minutes. And when we look at how we will support customers in those longer outages, and ultimately this does come right back to customers and society and the impacts that long duration outages or simply disruptions in your everyday activity um, impact people. And we are in a unique position right now to be able to look at really diverse solutions that have different levels of scope. It may be something that an individual customer invests in. It may be something that is a community scale or even grid scale solution. There are different levels of societal benefit. If I'm doing something to support myself, which does help support resilience of the system, uh, versus something that will benefit, directly benefit many customers and understanding what solutions or what portfolio of solutions of different scale and benefit um, is, is needed or fits the bill for, for a desired level of resilience. You, we do need to start talking about frameworks and metrics and just a ton of great work has gone on in this space. Um, trying to figure out how we do this planning across these different dimensions. And the piece that we really focus on in this EPRI interest group is valuation. In order to make decisions about uh, what investments make the most sense, we are interested in getting to a place where we can put, um, as, as Phil introduced, put some value on those kilowatt hours that are not served and doing so becomes increasingly challenging as we rely more on electricity, particularly for something like electric transportation. How does that change the value of a kilowatt hour when people may be relying on that to evacuate um, or if response fleets are relying on that to, to help restore and serve customers? How does it change as we also possibly start to rely on clean electricity for our um, fuel needs? If we have electrofuels and, and renewable gas that we're using, um, and we also know that there is there's changing uh, changes coming for the system in terms of climate adaptation and what we're building back to, or or what we're trying to the value that customers see and the needs that they have may change over time as well. Um, so, huge opportunities here. People are keenly interested and in, in, um, unfortunately sometimes because of, of events and the need to respond or prepare in coming to a place where we have transparent um, approaches to doing this valuation and estimating outage costs so that we can efficiently and, and more expediently make these investments. We've convened this interest group this year, and um, it, it really awesome activity bringing together our vast network of subject matter experts at EPRI. We do a lot of work ourselves in threat and risk assessments and looking at infrastructure, hardening, hardening opportunities, um, customer resilience solutions, economics, utility programs, et cetera. Um, and then, Bringing in all this stuff that's been going on within the industry as well, there's just been a ton of work going on in the space of resilience frameworks, metrics, valuation, um, a lot going on in the U.S., a lot going on internationally through the, the um, national grids in the U.S. So really great opportunity to bring together all of that information and work and with multiple stakeholders get an agreed upon set of of GAP, and from that, draft a research roadmap for putting together some of these tools and bringing some of these novel approaches to valuation um, into a strategic plan, and then starting to scope and then get into some of the research in the coming years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it just to provide some context while we are really focused on the value piece and estimating costs, we do know that along with that, we're trying to understand what is the resilience gap to fill? Where are we trying to get? Um, what, 
what do we get from resilience solutions? How do they impact resilience or allow us to better mitigate, adapt, or restore from outages? We want to understand all of the benefits or the impacts from those solutions. And then ultimately, we're driving towards that business case or that bottom line benefit that, that tells us that here's, here's the order in which, or here, here's a way that we can prioritize these investments. And um, driving home again, that we're really focused on the outage cost estimates, although they're used in, in all of these frameworks and in pieces. Um, we do have a, a number of folks that are participating in this collaboration this year, including a number of utility partners, Southern Company has, a, has several reps on, on this um, interest group, and we have really broad participation across a range of types of utilities. We've got um, major research organizations that have been working in the metrics and valuation space, NARU, NASIO, the state energy offices, international regulatory participation, and um, and uh, really honored to have the DOE Office of Electricity and Edison Electric Institute as key participants as well. So it's a really neat engagement if, you, um, if you're interested in learning more. A lot of the discussion focuses on what we're trying to accomplish in, in putting or in um, investing in resilience solutions. And we talk a lot about um, well understood and some even novel approaches to, to doing valuation. And um, some of these slides are a little bit of an eye chart and, and more for reference materials. So, um, but we, we take a look at a number of different ways of coming at valuation, looking at bottom up approaches where we're asking customers to, um, to tell us what they would prefer. We look at what customers have actually done their revealed behavior, um, understanding what measures people invest in currently to avoid outages <clears throat> and increase their own reliability can tell you a lot. Um, they typically don't arrive at the same place. We can look at, at insurance loss data and try to extrapolate, um, and there's Alexa reminding me to fill my water, so get a little resilience update from her. Um, and then there are ways to come, up, come at this from the top as well, and we can look at on a regional or on an economy level, when you have a disruption or you have some change in, in supply, and in this case, electric supply, how does that ripple through the economy <clears throat> and ultimately disrupt supply and economic activities and customers? Um, I've included a few examples in these slides that folks can take a look at, but in looking across um, regulatory filings related to resilience, there's a great NARUP document um, that talks about how folks have come about this at, in different ways. The ICE calculator is a really um, popular way to estimate customer willingness to pay or the business impacts of outages with some limitations. So you do see a lot of the ICE calculator used. However, um, to date, there hasn't been a regulatory filing for customer-cited or microgrid types of resilience solutions where the, estimating the value of resilience has, um, has gotten the thumbs up from the governance and stakeholders involved. So while there are ways to estimate some of these costs, they're not at a point where everybody agrees, yes, that value does represent not just the direct impacts to the folks in the microgrid, but also the benefits to the rest of the community, the rest of the region, how do you parse that out and, and uh, recover those costs. So that, that is to say that we are at a place where people are keenly interested in making these investments and justifying them in a way that allows us to quickly get um, solutions put into place. Um, and in this interest group, we will be spending the remainder of our webcast focused on specific approaches and harder to quantify or, or value pieces. And we've asked participants to look at a number of um, costs that, that come as a result of long duration electric outages 
and ask folks to prioritize which components do you need to be estimating? Why is that piece useful? And what's the challenge in estimating that today? And hearing from our participants, um, it's, it's not surprising that really understanding for long duration outages, what business interruptions cost, um, what is the damage or the cost when you have essential facilities that are not available or damaged infrastructure? Um, what does it cost if you cannot get out and access resources within your community and you have to go further in order to get your needs met? And, um, and then, of course, probably the hardest one to estimate, loss of comfort, certainty, and connection. So we'll be getting into these spaces over the next four months and really looking at what R&D is needed in order to allow us to start making some of these estimates um, and, and what tools are needed to start capturing some of these and, and giving us the ability to combine. I have a slide in here that just speaks to the scope. Um, the, the cost aspect of resilience is not unlike other aspects. There's, it's, it's tricky. And it depends on who you're talking about, who's investing, who's approving, what threat you're talking about, um, and uh, and different stakeholders and governance involved. No matter what, no matter what angle you're you're talking about, or across some of these different categories, and then also just to pull us back up again. While we focus very specifically in the interest group on valuation, that builds into um, investment decisions and ultimately every piece of our utility system um, is, is weaving that resilience piece in the planning in a different way. Um, so being, done, being able to understand how customer sighted solutions, DER, um, how all of that could then come back and be operationalized or be taken into account as you're doing your planning for your distribution, for your transmission, for your resources is really, um, is really key. And that's, that's a big part of this conversation is how do we get value so that we can talk across those different levels. Um, one of the biggest challenges folks are interested in doing here is uh, being able to do things like value DER solutions alongside more traditional resilience solutions, um, accounting for distributional effects, which is a big piece of the, the data platform opportunity is really understanding um, what locational um, resources and preferences look like and, and being able to maybe measure some of those spillover effects or, or understand how, how impacts spread around. Um, and I would invite you to please reach out if you're interested in participating. If you have um, feedback on valuation gaps and experiences beyond what we hear about today, I'd love to hear about that. We've got upcoming webcasts throughout the rest of this year before we finish out our roadmap. Um, and thank you for your time. Wonderful, Sarah, thank you very much. And uh, it, it's very thoughtful and a uh, uh, lot of information there. So uh, just a quick reminder for, for the audience, if you have a question, you can type your question on the, uh, the chat function. If you go down below of your screen, you will see an icon and uh, you can type your question in, uh, through the chat function. So now we will transition from a group of utility perspective to the federal perspective, we will have a, Stephen Walls from Department of Energy to share with us his perspective and the federal perspective. Stephen? Thank you, Ang, and uh, thank you, Omar, for having me. I'm really happy to be here with my other distinguished panelists. And hopefully, um, you'll hear some recurring themes in my few slides that you've heard already from Phil and Sarah, and hopefully, a little bit of new information as well. Uh, as you see here on the title slide, this is a after talking about definitions, we'll talk a little bit about my perspective on the Hurricane Maria recovery work that we've done following Puerto Rico um, in Puerto Rico. And just to, to flag that there was huge team effort. Uh, Phil mentioned power secure earlier. They were definitely involved. There's 
hundreds and thousands of folks involved in the effort. So I, I don't want to take uh, any undue credit for, for, for quote, leading that response or anything, but I, I, this is my perspective on that. Here's some thoughts from, from my corner of that work. <laughs> so for resilience, for the definition, I have a luxury oftentimes as a federal employee of having my mind made up for me. And, and the definition of resilience is one, one of those. It is defined for us in the Presidential Policy Directive 21. You can see the definition there on the screen. I have highlighted the key phrases in bold, I think, the prepare for and adapt to changing conditions, withstand disruptions and recover rapidly from disruptions, which to me are the, the working parts of that definition. It's not the only one, as you all well know. Uh, Sarah talked about how to define it, so does Phil. Uh, there's dozens or even a hundred and some, depending on how you count them, definitions out in the wild of resilience with regard to infrastructure systems. You see two citations down there. Uh, for anyone who's looking for an academic paper on the subject, I highly recommend the paper by Ayub called Systems Resilience for Multi-Hazard Environments. Uh, it, to me, is a very good overview of the rigorous approach to resilience that I think is excellent um, and kind of underscores how much more work there is in front of us. You know, so those key phrases from before that were in bold kind of imply a, a few different capacities to, in order to implement it. One is a planning capacity. You know, if we can't plan for an event, then resilience would be hollow. So Phil mentioned some hardening of some infrastructure that's in there. We've got efficient redundancies, and that's, to me, that's another way of saying recover rapidly. During an event, especially of the type that Sarah identified, the high impact, low frequency variety, there will be asset failures. And the question, the challenge to us is to identify how to make redundancies for those asset failures efficient. There's something even a little bit more complex, I think, in the definition of resilience, and that's adapt to changing conditions. To me, that implies that there's uh, more than one equilibrium state. In other words, depending on the threat that you're facing, you know, system operations will might be facing different um, temporary steady states, if you will, for lack of a more artful way of putting that. So the system has to be able to serve people where they are. And that's, that service has to be threat neutral or multi-hazard. So wind and, wind and water together for a hurricane or Superstorm Sandy um, or um, hopefully you know, some man-made event combination with natural event. Hopefully we never see that. But it's really more, uh, it's, there's a planning element to it. and as we've discussed so far here and with Sarah and Phil, it's, it's not exactly easy to put your finger on what resilience is or how to measure it. Yeah. So we're in OE, we're the Office of Electricity, where I work, we're thinking through it from a number of different perspectives. It's been an increasing focus for the office the past few years, and there are a number of folks in the building working on it. So um, there's more than any one person can keep track of. Uh, I know Phil and Sarah have both mentioned projects that I'm not involved with, and they're both great portfolios. Uh, so just to underscore that, um, if you want to know everything that DOE is, resilient, is, is doing in resilience, um, we might not have time to tell you everything before a new project starts. <laughs> um, and on that note, I just want to plug there was the Building Technologies Office in the Office of Electricity and Renewable Energy had a request for information closed a few weeks ago regarding connected communities. And those RFIs often precede funding opportunity announcements, so that's one thing to keep an eye on. I see one question about transactive energy so far. You know, that the focus of connected communities and that RFI welcomes any comments on transactive energy. So if folks are interested in that, they can go look at the RFI responses and then stay tuned to the Building Technologies Office for anything that might be coming out in the next few months. But within OE, 
we're looking at the context of things, characterizing threats. Bill mentioned elasticity in demand and whether it can be shifted from one time to another. Um, another, and Sarah mentioned the kind of top-down or bottom-up approaches to things. And that's, we're looking at the burden to access critical services. So that's, you know, you're an individual in a given place, something bad is happening, you need to get to a hospital. How much of a burden is it for you to get from where you are to the hospital you need? Part of that's looking at flexibility. It's in part system availability is particularly at the bulk power level, but there's also a consequence aspect to it because as we, you know, by definition, if we're in a high impact, low frequency event, there will be asset failures and there will be consequences. The, the challenge is how do, we, I, how do we identify what those consequences on actual humans will be and mitigate them? So part of that's gaps and potential solutions. We've, we've got some modeling efforts going on, looking at DER and microgrids, sensors, metrics, maturity models. I think maturity models might be a particularly useful paradigm for this space. One thing in particular that I'm interested in, and I'll talk a little bit more in the remaining slides, is linking bulk power availability to um, access to services at grid edge. And then, of course, all of this has to be coordinated across different stakeholders and levels of governance that don't always share the same perspective or evaluate trade-offs the same way. So establishing a framework to do that, facilitate those discussions, will be important. In Hurricane Maria, we see here on this slide the variety of different analyses that the National Labs undertook as part of recovery efforts. We'll be focusing mostly on that last bucket, distribution and edge. For folks that have seen them before, the system advisory model and PV loss out of NREL are fantastic tools to value PV installations. And there's some distributed storage being incorporated into those tools as well. So folks that know it, continue, please continue to use it. For the folks that don't, SAM and PV loss are both excellent at NREL. NREL also helps work on DER interconnection standards and fed recommendations back to relevant stakeholders in Puerto Rico. Sandia is working a little bit on feeder hosting methodology, but I really want to focus on the final two, which is um, contingencies at the edge and how to use GIS to improve resiliency. Uh, if anybody has questions about the other buckets or other work that we've done in this space, we, I'm happy to field those offline. So one of the tools that has been developed, and we have two labs working on this together, is, is GIS mapping of cr critical facilities by feeder. It's sort of like a distribution heat map, for those of you that know what those are. Um, but it tells you the, the feeders adjacent to critical facilities of different stripes, the customers that it serves, the number of outages, and other related information. We're still working on bulking this up, but I think there's a lot of potential with this approach to help people understand where the high priority sites for, for resilience microgrids could be. And, and a little bit more practical side, the Sandia and Oak Ridge also worked to identify where microgrids could be placed at industrial sites to keep industrial facilities up and running in Puerto Rico, working with the Puerto Rico Industrial Development Company. And they used a tool called the Microgrid Design Tool. For those of you familiar with it, hopefully you think that it's as great as I do. But for others, please go, uh, you can search for it on the web, Microgrid Design Tool. Um, it's an Excel-based model, but you can actually do some one-line diagrams and some do valuation and see what different asset portfolios and even a little bit on the operational side, what different operational stuff would do to the overall value of your microgrid. It's a helpful kind of tool to go from the ideation stage uh, towards a procurement. It doesn't get you all the way there, but it's, it's quite useful. Or at least I think it is. 
This is a, what you see here is a picture of the burden to access critical services as measured by Sandia National Labs. There's a, a guy there, Bobby Jeffers, and other, you know, he works with a team there. All of this stuff is a team effort, so don't want to give, it's just hard to acknowledge everybody all the time. But he's developed, they have developed a methodology, and they call it RedCat. I wasn't involved with the naming, don't blame me. But you can find it if you search for that. The methodology accounts for the burden on individuals to access a wide basket of critical services in the case of an event or an outage. So it has that you can, unlike a top-down approach where you hit tractability problem, moving beyond a single threat, this bottom-up approach can look a little bit more at multi hazards or different hazards and kind of combine them all together. And it compares the cost of no mitigation versus a portfolio of distributed energy resources, including microgrids. So you can look at here's an event or here's what the risk, the burden to access critical services would be if we don't do anything. And here's what it would be if we under a different portfolios of DER and microgrid deployments. It's a really good methodology. You see the link to the paper there. I'm sure Bobby would be happy to answer questions about that if anyone's interested in digging into it a little bit more. So what we see from the results is that microgrids can be a key strategy to dock the tail of high impact events. So you see the histogram here is in the back, the gray is no DER or microgrid portfolio versus the blue, which there is a typo on this slide for anyone who's already reading halfway down in the bullet. The cost of the blue portfolio identified in blue is not 1100, it's 110. It's still a kind of an eye-watering figure, but it's, I mean, if someone tells you it's 110, not 1100, it sounds better. Um, not intentional, that is a typo, it's supposed to be 110. So we can see with this approach, you can actually, with some rigor, evaluate what the mitigated consequences actually look like for a portfolio of distributed resources. It's hard to say, and it's going to vary from place to place, which is you know, why context is important, whether the, that hundred billion, or just hypothetically, let's say in some scenario, there is a trillion dollar DER portfolio that someone manages to compute. Um, let's just go with that. Is that worth the mitigated consequences? It's hard to say in advance. So it's really going to matter having a discourse among the relevant stakeholders in a given place. Because depend, you know, if someone who bears the brunt of, and of, of a hurricane might say, yeah, that is 100% worth it, no question. And then someone who, but someone who doesn't feel the impact would have, might have a different answer to that. So even though we can do this rigorous work and get to a point where we can produce this histogram here, we still have a lot of work to do helping various stakeholders come to an agreement on what investment is worthwhile and what should be approved by regulators. Um, as Phil and Sarah both kind of hinted at, with resilience in particular, it's, it's extra challenging um, to get approval for these events, or for, for resilience investments rather, because I mean, you can finance almost anything that has predictable revenue, but when it's infrastructure for a low frequency event, the cash flow isn't predictable. So you have to think of traditional financing won't necessarily work. You can think of resilience, like Phil mentioned, as part of a value stack, and that might work, but then you're still left with the challenge of figuring out what the sweetener is to get over the line of the extra cost for resilience versus, a, versus not having those assets in the portfolio. And the one thing we're actively working on 
now is linking these in a linking the DER portfolio work that Sandia has done with bulk power availability that has happened at Pacific Northwest National Lab. In a nutshell, at PNNL, they have looked at the it, using dynamic contingency analysis and high fidelity GIS information, what different storms result in different outage profiles. And it obviously, you're stacking a bunch of assumptions in these models, but for anybody who's digging into the, the math of measuring resilience, that's just part of the territory right now. But they've done a really good job at setting up a, a methodology that about allows you to evaluate a single threat in a given place very, very well. So what I'd like to do is link them together. You see at the top some illustrative portfolios from PNNL where the hurricane is the red circle moving across and at, in, in sequence in the third snapshot in the upper right, I think that's upper right for you guys, you have an outage. Whereas on the other image opposite that illustrative portfolio two, the hurricane is able to move across the system without a full system outage, but you still see some stresses and some, some outages. At the distribution level, we know, or a utility should know, whether what their in the, what their uh, feeders look like from a safety safety KB um, perspective, and you see representations of that on the bottom there. So what we're looking at now is linking up problem feeders and bulk power outages given different circumstances, so that you can say well, it, to help prioritize where a DER portfolio or microgrid would have the most impact in mitigating consequences. So that's what we're kind of working on right now. Um, you know, I hope that no one was waiting for me to demystify all of this. I think it's complex and there isn't, we're just dealing with complexity right now, which is another reason why I think maturity models will be helpful for all of us going forward and working through these questions. As you see here, just some of, uh, some of the complexity, you know, if you want to have a resilient system, you need a, you need, you need a bunch of different capacities. You've got the planning capacity I mentioned at the beginning of my session, but you also need the baseline, you know, and as part of that baselining is determining what the bounds of your system may be. If you're Southern company, you might, or Georgia Power, you might say, well, my system is the, the asset that I own. But from a resilience perspective, as Phil indicated that on his last slide, that might not be the most useful definition of system. If you're trying to get at resilience and you've defined your system to be um, bulk power availability, I mean, it's sort of the question of what's the value of having a, a kilowatt hour, having a line energized if there's no one there to use it. But, so if you've got all, of, if you've got most of your lines up and running, but everyone's evacuated or tried to evacuate and they got stuck because they couldn't charge their electric vehicles, or the emergency shelter lost power, you know, from a resilient, if you're looking at it from the lens of resilience, defining what your system actually is takes on, and I think, um, somewhat unique importance. And of course, there's also a recovery capacity. You need um, you know, hardening the system is part of that, and that's a lot like normal reliability, but there's also, for a high impact, low frequency event, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, I think one thing, one key takeaway that I wanna emphasize for everyone, at least from how I think about resilience, is that it's more than just asset performance. And I think we could make, you know, some, we can make a grid bulletproof, uh, I guess literally and figuratively, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question of whether or not it's resilient. Because like Phil mentioned, the kilowatt hour only has value if someone's there to use it. So there's this, 
it's a little bit more complex of a system. With that, I'll close and, and happy to field any questions. Terrific. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Very good, very good. So, uh, already? Perfect. Uh, that's what I will try to ask about. Can you pull back to the slide number six? Anyway, uh, so let us let me have a one question and kind of warm up uh, the Q&A. Just another reminder for the audience, you know, please type your question to the chat or the Q&A, and uh, Oma and I are going to pick up these questions later. So uh, we have heard uh, from so, three of you of different demonstration and uh, a pilot project like Southern Companies, the Smart Neighborhood, and uh, APRI talk about the PEPCO's microgrid, and uh, Stephen mentioned you know, there's tons of uh, DOE uh, research or development projects going on. Then the question is, uh, um, you know, we, we realize a lot of entities explored opportunity to enhance resilience through either the connected buildings, customer DRs, how can we move from pilot or demonstration to the next phase? How can we scale up these technologies? So let's go from uh, Phil to Sarah and to Steve. Sure. Uh, yeah, great, great question. Uh, it's something that we are absolutely thinking about. Um, as fun as it is as a researcher to play with these technologies in real two real neighborhoods in the southeast, um, we, want, we want to see a second scale. Um, I, I, would, I would sort of approach the answer to this question a couple of ways. Um, you know, we are, seeing, uh, we are seeing some deployments at scale today. Um, so, you know, there are places, uh, you know, there are utilities around the U.S., um, Europe, Australia, uh, that are using batteries behind the meter, you know, significant numbers. I think South Australia probably has the largest with 50,000 batteries planned. Um, so, so those models uh, usually, um, you know, are, are market-based with some kind of uh, incentive. Um, so if the customer is sort of paying a portion, uh, either they pay up front or they pay a monthly fee. So for a level of backup power uh, for their, you know, their own uh, premise, um, and then, and but it's subsidised by the value that that asset can provide to the rest of the grid. So, I think the first answer is there. I think there's a market-based solution that utilities can try with different business models. Um, I would also say that having thought about this a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of these, uh, without naming the companies that are offering these kind of products, um, if, if, it, if it isn't a utility, um, you know, generally they're, generally they're, they're, they're not um, every segment of society, right? It's not um, low income customers that are, that are participating in general. Um, so I think utilities uh, and with regulators help uh, can play a role there to make sure that, that folks aren't left behind uh, in terms of making their, their own home uh, uh, resilient, especially in a situation where a lot of us are working remotely uh, and rely on internet uh, and power to, to, you know, to work and be productive. Sarah, anything you want to add here? Um, yeah, a little high level, but I, I would just say that um, the one thing that I see as being key is I think we've got a lot of really smart people working on the approaches to estimating the value and costs or the benefits that would come from solutions. Um, and the, the Bobby Jeffers example is just is, is really great, really cool work. So the technical stuff, I'm, I'm confident that all the really smart people on this call will bring what we need, but um, aligning the different people involved in, in this decision making is, to me, the trickier part. So really understanding the resilience needs and planning criteria across, you know, the board from the region to the state, city, county, um, being able to estimate the benefits and the impacts for those different 
those different levels so that people across the board can quickly sign off on on these investments and for the sake of resilience. So not not because resilience is stacked on top, but simply based on the value that they'll provide for customers. Stephen? Yeah, just to add, uh, agree with the responses so far, especially Phil, I think, relying on the market forces to make this work. Um, you know, that might mean, that's going to mean some evolution, I think, in, in business models and regulator thinking and looking a little bit more at rewarding performance and thinking electricity is more of a service rather than a commodity. You know, and, and we're going to start to do that in bits and pieces and take steps. And, and as, you know, those conversations mature, I think the outcome that Sarah wants where people get much more comfortable with seeing what a resilience portfolio looks like will happen naturally, but it's going to take, a, a you know, a bunch of, uh, discourse in the beginning, and that's the market does that extremely well. Great. Um, I, I have a question, and, and we'll get to a couple of questions that have come in on the uh, on the chat. But uh, j just thinking about you know the uh, the notion of high impact, low frequency events. I think one can't help but think about the current situation with the pandemic and the sort of that underscores the importance of preparing for. Uh, for, for such events. And, you know, um, so in, in that regard, with respect to customer DERs, they introduced a great deal of uh, ju just the sheer uh, n numbers of, you know, PV systems, storage, other kinds of things. It, it's, it's great resource potential uh, for, for mitigation, but also it introduces a great deal of, of complexity. And in thinking about, you know, especially in this time where we're looking at the, uh, you know, possibility of events like uh, the, the storms that Stephen mentioned, along with, you know, uh, disruptions caused by wildfires in California, where I am, uh, the importance of being able to uh, look at these impacts and the value of, of, of uh, you know, continuity of, of electricity, especially during a time where people are sheltering in place, uh, largely. So uh, just a question across the board about, uh, with respect to how we value Resiliency in terms of situations like we're in now, with, with in in the midst of a pandemic and dealing with that, how does that change the dynamics? And are there ways that we can uh, have mechanisms, uh, pricing and valuation valuation mechanisms to account for these uh, these types of dynamics? So I'll, I'll open that up for for everyone uh, to to comment on. I don't know, Sarah, you want to get started on that one since it's related to the you know value of resiliency. Oh, Sarah, I think you're on mute. And I'm on mute. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the pandemic and the current situation has really fundamentally changed our, <laughs> our capabilities in, in, um, in understanding customer value or how, what it means to customers to have certainty or to human beings to have certainty. And um, so we're, we really are in a unique place right now where stated preferences may be a, a tricky thing to really gauge um, what people want or, or need when you haven't experienced something. We're in a unique place now where we can um, gauge across the board and really have conversations about what it means to, to be cut off or to feel cut off. Um, and I think also really interesting time and Omar, some of the work that's going on with run with it and looking at, at data, um, just the, the ability to get into customer willingness to pay and look at how that changes as people experience events and how, you know, how that even changes once you've experienced many and how it may drop off really unique opportunity. Mm -hmm. Phil, any thoughts you'd like to add on that? No, I, I'd echo Sarah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Just one thought. There's um, an IEEE paper that IEEE developed on COVID impacts, and it's um, worth a read just upon that. Okay. 
Okay, uh, let me try to pick up one question here. Uh, first, let me read the question, then I want to uh, pivot the question a little bit, ask a, a, a slightly different way. So the question is, have the presenters had exposed experience with transactive energy approach to microgrid operations? That's exactly the question received. Then what I'm trying to ask is, uh, we, there are several different uh, uh, concepts uh, floating around in the industry. One is a virtual power plant and uh, transactive energy. And also we talk about resilience, talk about the microgrid. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the VPP and transactive energy is more like incorporate market pricing mechanism to reflect the value of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of connected devices or DERs. Then we talk about the value of resilience today and uh, from um, all of you and how we can incorporate some mechanism. Could it be pricing? Could it be different mechanism? Into the platform, a data platform, be able to reflect the value of resilience. So it's two questions. One is any experience you have for transactive energy for microgrid operation. Second is how can we incorporate certain mechanism? Could it be pricing? and be able to consider the resilience into any data platform we talk about, like virtual power plant, transaction energy, et cetera. I can, hey, this is Phil, I can, I can have a stab uh, first. Um, yes, uh, we, we have had experience. So both the, the projects that I mentioned, and I, I know I glossed, I glossed over them quite quickly, just the technical detail, really the, the key research element was the transactive energy piece, which is what Oak Ridge National Lab is bringing to the projects. So um, in the case of the Alabama Power Smart neighborhood, uh, a price signal is being sent um, to a group of assets being the community microgrid and then the water heaters and, H and, and HVACs in the 62 homes. Uh, and so, you know, there's sort of that, there's a, there's sort of a two layer um, platform there um, where you've, you've got a price signal coming in through an aggregator and then you are modeling each, the capabilities of each individual home. You know, you're looking at things like, okay, is the price, uh, if I'm trying to minimize um, cost for the customer, you know, is the price of uh, pre-cooling, is, is the additional energy I'm going to use, say, pre-cooling the home to ride through a peak later in the day, kind of kind of outweigh um, getting through the peak, you know. Um, so you, um, you're looking, so, so what we found, you know, so you're starting to get experience with, okay, the arbitrage amount has to be a certain amount. Now, you may be optimizing to other things, uh, not just price. So, We've experimented with, well, let's maximize uh, the use of the solar in the market grid. So if there's a cloud, come, a cloud comes over the market grid, okay, maybe we pause um, the water heating and the, the cooling uh, or the heating of the house uh, and then start it back up again um, when the cloud comes over to maximize the self-consumption uh, uh, of the solar. Um, and so, yes, we, are, we, are, we do have experience with that. Um, the topic that is top of mind for us. Um, and, and to the second question, I, I, I can't think of another way other than price to incorporate it in. So I'd love to hear thoughts from um, either listeners or, or our other panelists, first off, um, what else we could use to, to incorporate resiliency. Uh, I'd be yeah, really interested to hear. Terrific. Any other Bill? thoughts? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll add um, a colleague of mine, Chris Irwin, I think, spoke a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully, he touched on transactive energy in, in his portfolio in that space. I think um, price is the mechanism we're all familiar with, and but to Sarah's point, I think discovering what people's willingness to pay in an actual resilience event is going to be hard, very hard to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, from a transactive standpoint, once you've got the contractual mechanisms on customer sovereignty hashed out, it's all about the arbitrage and making, 
and just you know that's going to the dynamics of that we might end up discovering fun, fundamentals that we can model you know across the country or across climate zones like temperature ranges and so on but it's still going to matter from neighborhood to neighborhood almost especially if it hasn't been built from the ground up like if you don't know that the houses perform in a, in a similar way from an envelope and heating cooling perspective and things like that you've increased the amount of complexity that you need to understand in order to actually price things appropriately um, and you know I think there's just a lot of work left to do to really get a mature understanding of what that looks like So yeah, and if I can, yeah, if I can add a final thought, I think, um, I think understanding what, what portion of the value may be something that could be a price mechanism versus um, something that's risk avoidance, because there's a value to people inherently in avoiding risk, um, whether or not it ever materializes, that's one value that's kind of your day-to-day -day, um, security blanket. And then there is that may be very real if there is an event value that may be much more, maybe much easier to tie to a price or, or um, you know, when you're actually trying to operationalize assets and, you know, call upon stuff, understand capabilities and, and have some kind of a financial inducement. So, so interesting because that, that value comes in a couple of different ways and how that is, is brought to the customer, how you induce customers to act upon that is, yeah, it could be complex. I'm gonna ask, uh, and we've got about eight minutes left, so we'll try to go a little bit more rapid fire here. We have a question, uh, and uh, this is, how might we leverage electric vehicles for residential resilience? Uh, I, the, the questioner, figured out how to power my house from my car for less than $50 CapEx due to uh, PG&E's uh, public safety power shutoff. So the question is, uh, leveraging EVs for resilience. Um, open for any, any one of our speakers. Great, great question. Um, love, love that question. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, electric transportation in general is gonna be the biggest uh, change to the electric grid um, as transportation gets electrified that maybe we've had since the creation of the electric power grid. It's gonna be a huge, uh, huge thing. Um, yeah, when you start thinking about, you know, electric vehicles, um, answering this specific question uh, that, uh, you know, for personal use, um, having, you know, 100 kilowatt hour batteries uh, and then realizing that most uh, stationary storage batteries uh, that are being put behind the meter today are, you know, anywhere from maybe eight to 16, 17, 18 kilowatt hours, um, you realize the resource um, that, that is there uh, if, if you can discharge uh, the battery. Um, so I think, you know, there are many days, um, just to confess to who knows how many people on the call, uh, that, you know, I'll be working on, um, you know, deeply in the area of leveraging, uh, say, residential water heating, electric water heating, uh, or uh, space heating and cooling, uh, and there'll be days when I think, gosh, is this going to just pale in, into uh, insignificance if you can leverage electric vehicle batteries because the resource size is just so much larger. Um, now, I think it's probably it's both and. I think um, both can play a role, but, yeah, I think electric vehicles are a huge resource to tap into. Um, very, very exciting. Uh, area and we are doing some research in in that area. Stephen, Sarah, anything you'd like to add? You know, I I, I think it's in, incredibly compelling, and and I'd be interested to see how do you again do that kind of shifting the value from from one player to another to make business cases. I, right now, I think there's just such a barrier because the product comes from an automaker and there's not a lot of incentive for, there's not a lot of market for them to make even, you know, like a $50 
upgrade to their vehicles um, if customers aren't asking for it or using that in, as a main decision point in purchasing vehicles. Um, so tremendous opportunity to find a way to translate that value and connect those dots. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, huge, huge potential resource um, if we can get that straightened out. Yeah, just to follow up quickly, there, with, as we see more and more variety of electric vehicles out there serving different markets, pickup SUVs, people will migrate to that technology. If you haven't test driven an electric vehicle yet, I highly recommend that you, go, that you do so. As an, as an owner myself, fantastic piece of hardware. And yeah, if at some point I could use that to provide backup power to my house, I mean, the battery's sitting in my garage right now. So I would love to be able to do that. Energy Systems Integration Facility at NREL is working on some vehicle to grid technologies, looking at you know different batteries, uh, inverter settings, and how they work well together. So that's one, one place to check out. But if that's how cutting edge that, that particular issue is. Well, yeah, you can definitely make it work. You can make your house talk to your car if you've got don't do don't try that at home unless you're properly certified to do so um it's really cutting edge i think especially for the mass market terrific we have about uh, uh three or four minutes left so let's try to wrap this up for this week's conversation last question is more like a magical one type of question so uh in all the the extreme events are very hard to predict and uh, it's also the the cost is very hard to, you know, hard in your system, and it's very hard to uh, justify. And uh, either taxpayer or ratepayer, whatever, who pay for it. Then uh, if you can, you know, do one thing, you know, and uh, be able to utilize any kind of data platform or methodology to unlock the value for all different type of players, like the customer, the DR provider, the utility, and uh, because utility is a highly regulated business, we have federal, we have state. So what is the magic wand you are going to use and why? Like a minute, maybe less than a minute for each of you. Okay, I, I've, I've got a magic wand. Um, poof, I would make, not so much a platform, I would make the data ubiquitous and easy to access, just if you could just unlock the data, um, get rid of that chicken and egg. You need the data to understand the business case. You need a business case to justify getting the data and to understand what architecture to put in so that you have a, a great long lasting investment that you, you know, never question and gets you 20 years out. So I would just unlock the data and take all of those, the questions of availability and getting to it and who owns it just totally off the table. Perfect. I'll love the data. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would agree and actually had um I'd written down literally the words chicken chicken uh, or egg <laughs> in my answer. So that's good. Yeah, I would say uh I guess codes and standards uh for for a common uh data sharing platform. Um because I think sometimes codes and standards can be the spark to kind of get you past the chicken or the egg issue that, that Sarah was talking about. Yep. Those are both excellent answers. I think if we if we had a third wave of the wand, I would add um, customer engagement with their consumption. Because right now, there's time of use rights might help, but right now there's no incentive to defer your consumption. Peak exists because of the way the prices are set and established, and we need to fundamentally change that service customer relationship in order for the data platform to have the impact that it's supposed to. Wonderful. So Omar, I will Great. hand this to you to wrap up today's conversation. Sure. So on that magical note, I just want to first thank our, our speakers for a great panel, Phil, Sarah, Stephen. Um, this was fabulous. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, I think there were some other questions that the people had, uh, uh, we weren't able to get in in time, but uh, please feel free to um, reach out to uh, the speakers or to the moderators if there are any specific questions that we we're, weren't able to get to. Uh, but again, on behalf of uh, Liang and the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative from EPRI. We want to thank everyone for being a part of this uh, webinar. Uh, tune in same time next week for next week's session focusing on 
uh, transmission system operator perspectives and um, uh, uh, you know electricity wholesale electricity markets uh, and the impact of, um, of digital grid and customer uh, technologies in that space. So again, uh, thank you so much for participating. We're going to be uh, uh, closing and to have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.